While the Ferris wheel in Santa Monica is a slow, mellow ride and not scary at all, there were no seat belts and it tends to sway a lot. So I found myself clinging to the metal bar in the center, praying that I would not fall out. Of course, it's often during moments of fear that one starts thinking about religion or some sort of savior. And in my case, there's a lot to think about. In Abrahamic religions, a messiah is a savior or liberator of a group of people. The concept of a messianic age originated in Judaism, where an expected king of the Davidic line would restore the glories of its golden age. The Greek New Testament's translation of the term Christos became the accepted Christian designation, and more loosely, the term Messiah denotes any redeemer figure. So in Christianity, it's Christ, which means the anointed one. The redeemer in Islam is the Mahdi, meaning the guided one. In Zoroastrianism, the final savior of the world is called Salshant. The Buddhists have Maitreya, who is prophesied to appear on earth, achieving a complete enlightenment and then teaching the pure Dharma. In Hinduism, the Kalki is the prophesied final incarnation of Vishnu, to end the Kali Yuga. And Li Hong is a messianic figure in Taoist prophecies, expected to appear at the end of the world cycle to rescue the chosen people. That said, in Judaism, Moshiach, or Messiah, is traditionally believed to be a king with political implications associated with the return for certain Jewish sects to Israel after the Babylonian exile. Today's episode is too heavy to attempt on an empty stomach, so let's stop for a quick bite at Bubba Gump's Shrimp Company. My waiter suggested the Shrimper's Heaven, which is coconut shrimp, chili shrimp, tempura shrimp, and some mashed potatoes which I substituted instead of fries. While the view was nice, I was not impressed with the shrimps. So save your money and go to the Cheesecake Factory down the street instead. The first book that I published, and by far the most controversial, is called 1666, Redemption Through Sin, which revolves around the story surrounding one of the most notorious messianic figures in world history. In the year 1666, an exceptionally charismatic rabbi and Kabbalist by the name of Sabbatai Zevi declared himself to be the Messiah. Born to an affluent family in Western Anatolia, He was a particularly eccentric Jewish mystic who had attained a massive following over one million devotees during his lifetime, roughly half of the world's Jewish population in the 17th century. His extraordinary popularity, according to historians such as Professor Gershom Sholem, resulted largely from the publication and availability of what is today called the Lorian Kabbalah named after Rabbi Isaac Luria. His full name is Isaac Ben Solomon Luria Ashkenazi, commonly known in Jewish religious circles as Ari. Before we go any further, I'd like to go over his name, starting with Isaac, who in the Old Testament of the Bible is the firstborn son of Abraham and one of the three biblical patriarchs revered by Jews. Christians and Muslims. Isaac was the father of Jacob and the grandfather of the 12 tribes of Israel. According to the narrative, he died when he was 180 years old in Canaan, where he was also born. Incidentally, Canaan is the biblical term, the Greek term is Phoenicia, which comes from the Greek word phoinos, meaning blood red. In Hebrew, Ben, as in Ben Solomon, means son. And Solomon was a king in Israel who succeeded his father, David. 
Incidentally, the symbol on the flag of modern Israel is sometimes called the Star of David, but also the Seal of Solomon. And I'll leave a link in the description to a video I did covering its occult significance for those that are interested. The next part of his name is Luria, which is usually attributed to one of two towns in Italy, which can be traced back to an ancient Roman family surname, but in the English origin is a contemporary girl's name which means Brave Lioness, which I'll expand on in a moment. The final part of his name is Ashkenazi, which comes from Ashkenaz, who in the Bible was a descendant of Noah. Ashkenaz was the first son of Gomer, with Gomer being the grandson of Noah through Japheth. Noah allegedly had three sons, Sem, whose descendants are known as Semites, who were Western Asian Caucasian people who lived throughout the ancient Near East, including the Levant, meaning Assyria and Babylon, the Arabian Peninsula, and parts of North Africa. Ham was another son of Noah, and from this branch we have the Caucasian North African people, including the ancient Egyptians with their blonde and red-headed pharaohs, and the Berbers, or Amazigh, who were the original Moors that ruled parts of Europe for 700 years and are depicted like this in the art of the time. Which brings us to Noah's son Japheth, great-grandfather of Ashkenaz, an ancestor of the Slavs, Cimmerians, Medes, Ionians, Scythians, Cypriots, and many others collectively regarded as Aryans, who disseminated what are today known as the Indo-European or Aryan languages, including High German, which is where Yiddish comes from, the language of the Ashkenazi Jews. That said, let's get back to Luria, which I already associated with the lioness, but Isaac Luria's title was actually Ari, which is the Hebrew word for lion. In Greek, Ari is a common shortened version of Greek names like Aristotle or aristocrat, the majority of which are compounds of the adjectival superlative aristos, meaning best or superior. Ari and Bagdaga a southern Dravidian language means sun-like. In Scandinavia, meaning Old Norse, Icelandic, Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish, Ari means eagle, which it can also mean in German and Hebrew, but its primary meaning is lion, in the context of the sun at its brightest point. Esoteric interpretations of all Abrahamic religions as well as all religions associated with Aryans, such as Hinduism and the Mithraic Mysteries, which means the Iranian religion of Zoroastrianism, and any others use solar symbology or sun worship as a hidden occult representation for deeper esoteric philosophies, which are veiled in symbolism and withheld from the general public. In mystery school religions, or what became known as alchemy, as well as in the zodiac, the lion is the sun at its highest or most exalted point. While the term Aryan is often associated with Aries the ram, keep in mind that to the ancient Aryans, the real new year is in the spring, the time of Aries, and the prefix AR is a solar reference such as in the word Armenia, where Ar, or Ar, is the name of the sun, or sun god. The ancient Armenians called themselves children of the sun. When we look at the flag of Iran, we see the sun with a lion. Now, I know a lot of people will have trouble with this, because Iran, which is traditionally considered land of the Aryans, is at odds with the modern state of Israel, or the German nationalists of World War II also claimed lineage from ancient Aryans and were also in opposition to the people today collectively known as Jews. Putting political ideology aside for a moment, the term Aryan in the context of how it appears in the Hindu Vedas 
or etched in 2,500-year-old cuneiform in stone reliefs in Iran, Aryans were regarded as the nobility, a class of people of the elite caste from whom Gautama Buddha is also descended, as he was born of noble blood before he denounced his status to pursue the Noble Eightfold Path, which was originally called the Aryan Eightfold Path before they replaced the word Aryan with noble, as they're interchangeable. But the term Aryan has been shunned by academia and the media after World War II. The point I'm trying to make is that the rift between the ancient tribes known as Aryans and the alleged lost tribes of Israelites, they're one and the same which becomes evident when one analyzes the mythology, biblical and secular history, genetics, and occult symbols disseminated since antiquity. I've already explained why the royal families of Europe all share genetic affinities, including blood type, and why so many use the line of Judah with its tongue sticking out as a national symbol of nobility mimicking the coat of arms of Jerusalem, where Isaac Luria was born. I'll leave a link in the description to my video on lion symbolism. In rabbinic literature, the kingdom of Ashkenaz was first associated with the Scythian region, then later with the Slavic territories, and from the 11th century onwards with Germany and Northern Europe. This new Lurianic Kabbalah enjoyed broad dissemination in the 1500s thanks to the invention of the printing press in the previous century. Jews from around the world for the first time had access to occult literature about the deeper meaning of their faith and the popularity of Jewish mysticism soared. A key aspect of Lurianic Kabbalah is that it required active participation to set the stage for the arrival of the Messiah. To bring about conditions that would initiate or directly expedite the fulfillment of Jewish messianic prophecy. In other words, instead of simply waiting for God to act, the Lurianic perspective expected Jews to play an active role in bringing forth God's kingdom on earth. This new European Kabbalah, as opposed to the older Chaldean version, is unanimously attributed to Luria and was extremely popular at the time and still is the most broadly disseminated and used Kabbalistic system taught today. Part of this Kabbalistic method included ways of interpreting the supernatural relationship between events and time offered through letters and numbers. The magical emphasis given to the numerological value of dates contributed greatly to the widely held expectations and hope placed on the coming of a messiah at the time, particularly the 18th day, which is 6 plus 6 plus 6, of the 6th month of the year 1666. Most people have heard of Jesus Christ, considered the messiah by Christians, and who lived 2,000 years ago. But very few have ever heard of Zabbatai Zevi, who declared himself the messiah in 1666 by proclaiming redemption was available through acts of sin, he amassed a following of over a million passionate believers. As I said, about half the world's Jewish population during the 17th century. And although many rabbis at the time considered him a heretic, his fame extended far and wide. Sabbatai's adherents planned to abolish many ritualistic observances because, according to the Talmud, holy obligations would no longer apply in the messianic time. Fasting days became days of feasting and rejoicing. Sabbateans, as they called themselves, encouraged and practiced sexual promiscuity, adultery, incest, and religious orgies. Sabbatai Sevi's messianic claims were rejected by the leading rabbis of Jerusalem, as well as the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, who offered to behead him if he didn't convert to Islam, which he immediately did. Sabbatai's formal conversion to Islam really dismayed many of his followers, to say the least. But those who continued to be loyal to the Sabbatean movement 
took it as a sign to also convert to Islam while secretly maintaining their Jewish identity and mystical occult practices, which included religious orgies and sex magic and sacrifice. His followers are known today in Turkey as the Dolme, which translates to religious convert, a derogatory term which they themselves never used. And so the Lorian Kabbalah became a mystical synthesis between pagan or esoteric teachings which preceded the Torah and Gnostic elements of Judaism. Many texts pertaining to the Kabbalah, including the Zohar, say that the task is not to destroy evil, but to return it to its source. To put it simply, to include the left within the right in a Zoroastic metaphor, or to uplift the fallen sparks in the Lorianic one. The rapid spread of the teachings of Rabbi Isaac Luria, the Ari, or Aryan Lion, and his Lorianic Kabbalah resulted in a grafting of the then current theories of the Kabbalists onto the traditional Jewish view of the role and personality of the Messiah. This new philosophic paradigm, in the estimation of many scholars, provided a spiritual justification for proactive Zionism, and therefore the events that directly brought about the modern formation of Israel, which incidentally did not start in 1948 with the War of Independence, but a century earlier with the German Messianic settlers known as the Temple Society, or Templars, who supported the Nationalist German Party of the 30s, many of whom also populated Palestine during the transfer agreement, where tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of German Jews were covertly resettled into the Holy Land by the German nationalists the decade prior to World War II. After Sabbatai Zevi's death in 1676, his Kabbalist successor, Jacob Frank, expanded upon and continued his occult philosophy. Frankism, a religious movement of the 18th and 19th centuries, centered on his leadership and his claim to be the reincarnation of the Messiah, Sabbatai Sevi. He, like Sevi, would perform strange acts that violated traditional religious taboos, such as eating fats forbidden by Jewish dietary laws, ritual sacrifice, and promoting orgies and sexual immorality. He often slept with his followers, as well as his own daughter, while preaching a doctrine that the best way to imitate God was to cross every boundary, transgress every taboo, and mix the sacred with the profane. Jacob Frank would eventually enter into an alliance formed by Adam Weishaupt and Mayor Amschel Rothschild, called the Order of the Illuminati. The objectives of this organization was to undermine the world's religions and power structures in an effort to usher in a utopian era of global communism, which they would covertly rule by their hidden hand, the New World Order. Using secret societies, many through infiltration and corruption, their agenda has played itself out over the centuries, staying true to the script. The Illuminati handle opposition by a near total control of the world's media, academic opinion leaders, politicians, and central banks. Still considered nothing more than a theory to many, more and more people wake up each day to the possibility that this is not just a theory, but a terrifying, factual, and explosive conspiracy. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon 
as well as through various other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.